Furthermore, respect one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. I know that's not very popular in today's age, but we're going to get to it in a moment. He is the savior of the body of the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, Paul doesn't let us off the hook. He says, this means love your wives. Men, I need you to listen very carefully at the next instructions because they're pretty deep. They're pretty intense. He says, just as Christ loved the church, he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. So, lo- so husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church and we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is also an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Francis Chan says it this way, and I love this quote. He says, marriage is such a powerful way to display the gospel and the glory of God. Marriage is such a powerful way to display the gospel and the glory of God. It is the first place People can and maybe will look to see if we really believe what we say. Let that sink in for just a moment as you read that on the screen. Marriage is such a powerful way to to display the gospel and the glory of God. Because as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, so again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. We're going to take a quick look at the roles of holy matrimony. We're going to take a quick look at the roles that are lined out here in Ephesians chapter 5. But I know our culture well. I know myself well, and I know that in order to inspire me to do anything, in order to inspire me to enter into anything, in order to inspire me to engage in anything, I need to know the benefits of them. And so we're also going to take a look at the benefits to us, how it benefits our marriage, how it benefits our spouse, how it benefits us when we fulfill the roles that God has lined out for marriage. And we're going to talk about specific needs. And, and I, ladies in the room, I don't presume to know everything there is to know about women. In fact, I presume the, uh, the exact opposite. Um, I still make quite a bit of mistakes when it comes to my relationship to Danielle and my children and my relationships with you as I shepherd you as a church and as I relate to you as a pastor. Um, but I do know that through my trials and failures, I've come to the conclusion where I'm at today, and I pray that I would continue to grow in these. As I state most of the time to you all, I am preaching to myself just as much as I preach to you. And so let's dive in here real quick. I'm going to give you all three of the benefits first, and then we're going to go back through them. So as we fulfill our roles, the God-given roles of respect, of love, and of reverence, and I would say this, That in a nutshell, a man's role in marriage is leading in love. Leading in love out of sacrifice and surrender. And a woman's role in marriage in a nutshell is respecting in love. She brings to the marriage encouragement and discernment. And we'll talk about those in a few minutes. So I'm going to give you all three of these roles real quickly. First off, when we fulfill the roles that God has given us for marriage, first off, it allows each other's attractiveness to continue to shine. It allows our attractiveness to continue to shine. We'll talk about that in just a moment. It releases each other's God-given potential. Each of us have potential that are given to us by God. Each of us have a calling given to us by God as husbands and as wives, and this releases each other's God-given potential. And then last but not least, for this morning's sake, it disables each other's sinful nature. It disables our sinful nature. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So let's jump into this real quick. The first point is it allows each other's attractiveness to continue to shine. I know this might be hard to believe. 
I know this might be hard to believe, but I met Danielle when I was 20 years old. 1994, we met at a summer camp on the east coast of Florida. She came from Ohio. I came from over here to there. I would dare say that I am probably not in the, in the same physical shape and condition that I was then. I would dare to say that maybe a few things of me physically have moved around. Maybe my shoulders have slumped to my stomach just a bit. Maybe my hips have widened just a tad bit. Maybe I get a little bit more tired when I get up off the couch to get to the kitchen, get a little bit more winded than I used to. I would definitely say I had a little bit more hair back then. And I say all of that to say that physically our appearance changes from day to day. Physically as the years go by, as the past 25 years have gone by since I've met my wife, Physically, I have changed. And physically, I wonder sometimes, does she still find me attractive? Does she still think that I'm that handsome hunk that she saw tripping over a log or tripping over a skateboard or a a, a roller skating rink on my 20th birthday? And the thing that I love about her and the thing that I love about if I'm fulfilling the role of marriage, that her attractiveness to me and my attractiveness to her doesn't lie on physical, like the very thing that attracted me to her and hopefully the very thing that attracted her to me is no longer what we base everything on. Does that make sense? And so as we look at the attractiveness and what keeps us attractive is we need to look at man's greatest need and woman's greatest need. And I did a, 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 I did a, a crazy search on this one. I did a cra- I went to Barna. I went to all kinds of different researches. I, did, I, I spent most of my time on these two things right here. And I came back to the fact that man's greatest need in my belief is respect. A man will strive and work and do everything that he can. Cut his teeth on trying to gain the respect of others. Now some of the men in here will deny that. And they can, and I'm not saying it's across the board 100%, but for the most part, man's greatest need is respect. Woman's greatest need, as I've studied this and talked with Danielle and, and looked at this, woman's greatest need is security, is security. And so my role as a husband into Danielle's life is to provide her safety and security. Danielle's role in our marriage is to provide me with respect. I say it this way all the time. I could spend 8 hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day with you all. I could spend my time with you, dining with you, hanging out with you, uh, praying with you. You could come by the office. I could spend a lot of my day with you, and you would totally 100% respect me in every moment. I'm not saying that you do. I'm saying that I could gain, I could have your respect on a daily basis as a congregation. I could have the respect of everybody outside of Danielle in my world. And I would come home and I wouldn't have her respect. All of your respect would be diminished by that disrespect. Flip that around. I could be disrespected by everybody in this room. I could spend my entire day being disrespected by everybody I run into. And quite often, sometimes I do. I will admit that. Sometimes the way that you engage me, sometimes the way that the world engages me is disrespectful. Sometimes the way that I engage you, sometimes the way that I engage the world is disrespectful. But here's the ironic thing. If I came home to Danielle, who loves me, who respects me, who encourages me, it diminishes all of that disrespect. That's how important safety from the man to the woman is. That's how important encouragement and respect from the woman to the man is. It diminishes. Through me, the Lord can diminish anything that causes fear, anything that causes insecurity, anything that threatens Danielle's safety can be diminished through me. Anything that causes disrespect, anything that causes anxiety, anything that causes fear, anything that causes worry, anything that causes doubt in me can be diminished by the Lord through her. In fact, that's exactly how God has designed it. God unioned us together to be exactly that for each other. There is a prophetic movement that I know can only happen. There is a voice that I know can only happen. There is something that Jesus wants Danielle to feel. There is something that Jesus wants Danielle to hear, and he wants to do it through me, and vice versa. There's an encouragement. There's a a word. There's a prophetic happen stance that can only happen through Danielle to me. Husbands in the room, 
There are words of encouragement. There are words of love. There are words of affirmation that the Lord wants to speak into your life. And the only way he's going to do that, the only voice that he's going to do that through is you. Flip side around. There's a voice of respect. There's a voice of love. There's a voice of support. There's a voice of encouragement that the Lord wants to speak into your husbands. And the only way that he's going to do that in some instances, in some circumstances, is through you. And so when we fulfill the role of marriage as far as cherishing and honoring our spouse, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, ladies, as you respect your husbands, men, as you provide safety and security to your wives, all of the fear, all of the doubt, all of the stuff the enemy wants to bring against us out in this world is diminished through the Lord speaking through each other, through each other. And so our attractiveness to each other should lie in our respect for each other and our security that, only can be, that can only be found. Now think about this in your relationships outside of your marriage. Think about this. If we take these two and fuse them together and you fuse them into your lives, whether you're a man or you're, or you're a woman, and you walk this world with respect, you walk this world respecting and loving as Jesus Christ respected and loved the church, if you apply that to every relationship, if you supply every bit of security that you can find, that when you enter into a, a relationship or you enter into a conversation, even if you feel you're right and the other person is wrong, and you do that with love, you do that with respect, it provides security within that relationship. I travel closely with brothers and sisters who honor me. I allow into my inner circle brothers and sisters that honor me. And I, only know, and I know that I'm only going to receive that honor and that respect if I am honoring and respecting the relationships around me. This plays outside of our marriages as well. And we can all take on the role of respecting and providing security for our brothers and sisters in Christ that are around us. Second, as we fulfill the role of marriage, it releases each other's God-given potential. You know that man's greatest motivational need, you know what ma motivates men the most? To feel supported and encouraged. To feel supported and encouraged. Woman's greatest motivational need is to feel nourished and cherished. To feel like she matters. To feel like you care enough to step out of whatever your concerns are and into her concerns when she's around. And ladies, I know... I know this is a tricky one. This is a tricky one because as men, we have some dumb ideas. You didn't catch that. You didn't think that one was coming, did you? We have some weird ideas. We have some weird thoughts. We're adventuresome by nature. At some point in time in my life, I want to jump out of a perfectly good airplane and hurl my body, all 200 pounds of it, 199 pounds of it, at the earth. And I'm going to allow myself to be attached to another man to do this. And I'm going to put my trust in him that he's going to open the parachute. And I'm going to need Danielle to support me and encourage me in this. She hasn't quite yet. If you ever get a chance, you need to get on YouTube and Google why women live longer than men. There's some incredible videos out there of things that we do. But if God has called us to lead, and leadership is responsibility, God has called men to lead, and leadership is responsibility, then the best way that we can do that is by being encouraged and supported in what we're doing. Now, on the flip side of that, we're going to talk about discernment in just a few moments. A man's greatest motivation is to feel supported and encouraged. I love the way that Danielle can do this subtly. She's never come right out and told me I'm stupid. But her eyes say it all. Women, I think you would be, if you were honest with yourself, you would say that your greatest need is to feel nourished and cherished. Your greatest need is to feel like you matter. And when the world is going crazy all around you, 
and schedules are going this way and that. And I have to admit, since the first of the year, that's kind of been Danielle and I's lives. Going every which way but right. I've eaten more Chick-fil-A lately and loved it because of our schedule. Just the blessing of a busy schedule. But in the midst of all that, I know that there's moments where I have to stop and I have to nourish and I have to cherish and I have to admit that I fail because there's times where I'm just like, oh my gosh, like the church needs me, the boys need me, Danielle needs me. The church needs me, the boys need me, Danielle needs me. And if you would stop and admit to yourselves, men, sometimes our wives get the last bit of what the last bit of nourishment or cherishment that we have. A couple of weeks ago, I failed miserably. Danielle was deathly sick, and I mean deathly sick. I almost called in the elders to anoint her with prayer, and she doesn't get, eat, she doesn't get sick long. She's, she's a rock. But as I'm leaving for leadership team meeting that week, she says, hey, could you check in the pantry to see if we have some chicken noodle soup? I said, I would love to, honey. I'm running late, but I will dig through the pantry. And so I open the pantry, and I don't see chicken noodle soup. And I dive into those cans, and I get all the way to the back, and I find two cans of chicken noodle soup. You guys don't seem excited about my chicken noodle soup. So I set the chicken noodle soup on the countertop with a bowl, and I leave. Some of you see where this is going. It took her a week or so, and we were, I forget who we were with, and I said something cocky and arrogant about how great of a husband I am, and she gently, lovingly said, here's how great of a husband you are. I asked you to see if there's chicken noodle soup, and I came out of the bedroom, and there it was on the countertop. Unbeknownst to me, I was supposed to actually heat up the chicken noodle soup. But I did exactly what I was told, right? Which, which, right? <laughs> Whoever said no the loudest, I no longer am praying for you. In that moment, I can only imagine, because I wasn't home, she's walking out thinking, you know, sick. He cared enough to make, and she sees two cans and a bowl. We joke and laugh. I'm glad that my wife has a crazy sense of humor. And one of the things she's never done to me is in all of the dumb decisions I've made, we're going to share this one in just a few moments, but she's never looked at me and said, I told you so. She's never looked at any mistake I've made. Now, granted, she's helped, been very corrective in some of the mistakes, and I love her for that. But in that moment, I, I thought I was honoring her, but, but in my busyness, I dishonored her in a moment. And I should have known I should have known. I mean, I've been married for 24 years, and trust me, I will never make that mistake again. But I wonder if our schedules get so crazy and so busy that each other, in each other, is what pays the price, our husbands and our wives and our relationships. So here's my challenge this week. Valentine's Day is Friday. Take a moment. I know it's called, if you're like me, I I hate to do stuff because I have to do it. But sometimes we need to do stuff because we have to do it. It primes the pump. It gets us going again. It revives and it restores. You got a week. Gentlemen, men, you've got an entire week. All right? Most of you will do it at midnight on Thursday. But do something. Do something to cherish and nourish your wives. And ladies, I would flip that around. Maybe there's something that, Maybe there's something you've been criti- critical of. Maybe there's something that you've been, been I don't want to use the word because I hate the word critical. We'll stick with critical for sake of me getting to my car after the church, after the service is over. And maybe it's time to just step back and pray. I heard it say this way, and I have to use the word. I heard a pastor say, this was Jimmy Evans, and I love the way he said it. I'm going to try to get it right. He said, Be careful in your marriages that the thing you overdo is your prayer for the other spouse. You're going to overdo anything in your marriage. Don't overdo critical criticism. Don't overdo nagging. Don't overdo, don't overdo anything 
but prayer. Because as you saturate your spouse in prayer, as you saturate your marriage in prayer, it will be filled with love. It will be filled with respect. It will be filled with encouragement. I know that there's times, I know that there's times when I say something or do something, and Danielle's like, ah, I'm just going to pray that one out of him. Wives, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you soak us in prayer. You soak us in genuine God-centered, seeking the face of God for us, prayer, the Lord will move. The Lord will move. And so maybe there's a situation or a circumstance, maybe there's something in your marriage that needs to move. Maybe there's something that's worth the criticism, that's worth, the, that's worth your concern. I would say pray. Saturate that in prayer. And finally, as we fulfill the role of as we fulfill these roles, it disables each other's sinful nature. It disables each other's sinful nature. See, a role, one of the roles in marriage for a man is responsibility and leadership. A woman's calling, in a nutshell, into the marriage is discernment and accountability. A man's role is responsibility and leadership. A woman's calling is discernment and accountability. Let's rewind all the way back. Let's go all the way back to Adam and Eve. As I studied for this and as, as the Lord took me back to Adam and Eve, there's something that I'd never realized. See, I always had this, this weird theological thought that Adam was out hanging out with the Lord, you know, being a godly man and doing all that stuff, and Eve got enticed, got enticed while she was all alone. Like they had been separated for it. And if you read closely in the word, that's not the case. Because the word says that Adam was right there. So Eve's having this conversation. She's being enticed. And so what she did is she let down her discerning guard. She stepped out of her role of discernment in the marriage. And she allowed herself to be enticed. And Adam, which the word says that Adam was right there with her, watched it happen. So he stepped out of his role of leadership. He stepped out of his role of responsibility and he watched his wife get enticed by Satan. She, he watched his wife, he watched, he listened to the conversation but never stepped in. And so Adam and Eve's first mistake was stepping out of their roles of marriage. Adam no longer was leading. Adam, no, Adam should have stepped in and said, uh-uh, no way, that is not the, that's not the road we're going to go down. We can't go down that road. Eve should have discerned it right away. Eve should have seen, oh, no, I can't, I've got to, even if he passes by me. So I, I would like to think that if, if the enemy didn't get what he wanted out of Eve, he was going to bypass Eve and then go to Adam. Now, this is just me thinking. Like, I think if, if, the, if the discernment meter on Eve would have been up and would have been working and she would have engaged that role, then, then the enemy would have bypassed her and then tried it on Adam. And then Eve would have been able to step in and say, uh uh no, he's already tried this. The enemy's already tried to come against us, Adam. You can't listen to him. And they would have walked away from it. By Eve's discerning, they would have been able, she would have been able to advise Adam and Adam would have led them out, would have led them out of the fall. Well, we know the story. We know that Eve did not use her discern her responsibility of discernment. We know that Adam did not le use his leadership responsibility, and they stepped into it, and they stepped into it. So if a man's calling is responsibility and leadership, then men, we need to lead. Because leadership is influence, and leadership is responsibility. And ladies, I will say this to you. You have a discernment meter in you by the power of the Holy Spirit that we as men sometimes don't have or most often don't have. And we need you. Men in the room, I would advise you to give your wives room to speak into your life. When I counsel men, I ask them all the time, how much room does your wife have to speak into your relationship? How much wisdom are you allowing her to speak into your relationship? How much wisdom are you allowed? How much of her discernment meter do you listen to? And I have to admit, there's been times throughout my ministry career, throughout our relationship, that Danielle has tried to stop me. That she has said no to this or no to that or we need to be careful with this or we need to be careful with that. And I haven't listened. And again, I would say the thing I love about her the most in any of those times that I haven't listened and I've led us down the wrong path because of that, 
Because of that, she's never once said, I told you so, I told you so. She's never done that. She's literally helped me get us back on the right path or help us step out of the muck and the mire that I just led us into. That I just led us into. I'll be honest with you, one of the things that was very attractive to me about Bayshore Church in the seeking and the praying was the fact that the women in this church are given a voice. There is a place for leadership for women in this church. Something I wasn't a part of or, or, or haven't been a part of for quite a few years. And that was something that was very attractive. Danielle will tell you, I come home from leadership team meetings, I say, it's good to have some godly women around that table with us because their discernment meters come up and they help us and they direct us and then we can lead because of it. Man, I'm going to be awful hard on you about this one. If your wife cannot speak into your marriage, then you are headed for trouble. Let me say it again, men. If your wife does not have a voice into your marriage, you are a dictator. In your marriage. And I know that's heavy. And I know that hurts. And maybe it cuts to the bone. You have a responsibility to lead. Women, you need to let him lead. You need to give him room to lead. But men, if you don't give her a voice to speak into your leadership, then he can't lead you then he can't lead you. Notice in verse 30, 31, it says, As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So I again say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. One thing that I want to leave us with this morning is ultimately in any relationship, Ultimately, ultimately, our calling is to follow the Lord. Ultimately, our calling is to serve the Lord. Men, if you're not doing that, your woman's ultimate calling, your wife's ultimate calling is to serve and grow in the Lord. If you're not following the Lord, she can't follow you. She needs to be able to follow the Lord through you, but the only way that she can do that is if you're in line with the Lord. Jimmy Evans has this this great illustration, and I've used it in a wedding once, but he says if you think about the line of authority, the line of communication, the line of how the the Heavenly Father speaks to the family, you've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, then you have husband, wife, children. It's a straight line. But what happens if husband isn't following the Lord and he steps out of that line? The communication still has to get to the children. And what's happening in our culture a lot of times is that the communication no longer reaches the father and the wife has to lead the family. Because if you're stepped out over here, she can't follow you because the line of authority, the line of communication that the Lord has from the Heavenly Father through the Holy Spirit or from the Heavenly Father to the Son through the Holy Spirit to us is straight. That line has to stay straight. That communication, that download from the Lord has to stay straight. And if one of us is out of line, then the other can't follow the other. I can't listen to Danielle's discernment if she's not under authority of the Holy Spirit. She can't lead or follow me if I'm not under the authority of the Holy Spirit. If I'm not praying, if I'm not worshiping, if I'm not studying, if I'm not, if I'm not encouraging and respecting and nurturing and cherishing her in the power of the Holy Spirit, she can't follow me. Vice versa, if she's not doing that, then I can't listen to her discernment meter. If she's not worshiping and praying and seeking the Lord herself, then how can I trust in that discernment meter? And that's part of the issue in our culture is we're not fulfilling the role, the God-given roles of marriage, and so one can't follow the other because of it. And it creates tension. It creates tension. Here's the thing. I say this to men all over. Men, if you're not providing safety and security to your wife, she's going to find something or someone that will. Ladies, if you're not providing your husband with respect, he's going to find something or someone that will. If you're not supporting and encouraging... We start to look other places for it. If we're not nourishing and cherishing, we're going to start looking other places for it, or the enemy can get in through those cracks. 
If we're not being responsible and following the spirit and, and, and fulfilling the call to leadership as men, then she's going to be enticed to find something or someone that will. Women, if you aren't using that discernment, if you aren't calling us as men into accountability, we're going to find something or someone that will. It's just that simple. My prayer for us as a church is that we are men and women under the authority of the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit in every relationship, in our relationships with our wives, in our relationships with our husbands, in our relationship with our children, in our relationships with each other, in our relationships with each other. And as we do this, as we do this, the gospel is expressed. Jesus Christ is expressed through our relationships, through our marriages. As we answer the call of God and fulfill the roles, the God-given roles of marriage, then we are fed with respect, blanketed with security, motivated by support and encouragement, nourishment and cherishment, we are answering the call of responsibility and leadership. And we are listening to discernment and we are accountable to it all. That's what I want to see grow in this church. Grow in not just our marriages, but our relationships with each other. Would you close your eyes as the band comes forward? This morning, the word, one of the things that I, there's two words that I want us to share, and I used this word a couple weeks ago, and the word was enrichment. I challenge married couples all the time that don't wait until, don't wait until you need marriage counseling to go get marriage counseling. Allow yourselves to be in places where marriage enrichment, where your marriage is enriched on a daily basis before the fact. See, too many times we fall into, we fall into after the fact. We fall into uh, tragedy or we fall into repairing what's taken years to destruct. And I would encourage you, whether you're in a dating relationship or you're in a, in a marriage, whether you've been married for less than a year or you've been married for over 50 years, marriage enrichment. Marriage enrichment needs to be a part of your daily walk. It needs to be something that you're continually discerning, watching for. Marriage counseling isn't just for when your marriage is on the rocks. Marriage enrichment keeps your marriage from being on the rocks. And so maybe this morning, maybe this morning the Holy Spirit has brought something to your attention or quickened your heart. And I would ask you just to listen. I would ask you just to listen. I believe there's some men in the room that your hearts need to soften towards your wives believe there's some women in the room that your hearts there's some women in the room that your hearts need to soften towards your husbands I come from a really rough example of marriage and because of that the first three years of my marriage was pretty rough but I know that I serve a God that loves me. I know I serve a God that loves Danielle. I know I serve a God that can restore me, restore us. I know that you serve a God that can restore you. So Father, I just pray that the Holy Spirit right now would speak to us. in a very, very special, very, very 
sensitive way. I pray for healing and restoration. And I pray, Lord, that we would take a hold of the role that you've called us as husbands. We take a hold of the role as you've called have that you've called us as wives. And I pray, Lord, that we would apply these principles not just to our marriages, but to every relationship. May we allow for accountability in our lives from all of our relationships. May we rise up out of this place as leaders. Would you rise up out of this place a spirit of discernment and direction to navigate Not just our marriages, but any and every relationship we're a part of. And may we respect and honor everybody as we respect and honor ourselves. So this morning, I'm going to ask the ushers to come. I'm going to ask you to do something very, 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 very careful for me this morning. There's a phrase that I'm learning in our world of today. application of things may change from time to time but the principle of it doesn't so we're going to do communion this morning and we're going to do it in a much much different way than what Bayshore is used to doing it so as we sing this next song the ushers are going to pass a bucket and you'll find a little cup it's a little bit weird I'm not going to lie I've been having fun with this in the office all week But there's a reasoning we're doing it this way, and I'll explain that in a few moments. So as we sing, ushers pass out the elements. Just grab one of the cups. The wafer comes with it, and I'll explain that here in just a few minutes. Let's sing. If you want, you can stand. could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages sent down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, how yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. 
so if you take the cup and you point the little pointer at you, the first step, there's a very fine piece of film. It's clear. Don't pull the whole thing up at the same time. There's a, there's a top that brings just the wafer. Now, before you eat, I'm going to ask us to do something. And if you're sick, I invite you not to participate in this part. You can just take it of yourself. Something incredible about bread, or any type of food for that matter, that when you eat something, you're literally taking it in to yourself. Anything you eat, you literally take in, and it, it, I don't, I'm not, was never good at science, but it literally permeates your being inside. So in a sense, Jesus was saying, as you eat of me, you're taking me in. This represents my body, which has been broken for healing. I need you to take my body in. It's a declaration of what Jesus has done for you. So this morning, maybe you're hurting physically or there's healing that needs to take place physically. And I would invite you to believe that this isn't just a symbolic act this morning. This is you saying, I believe in healing. And husbands and wives, if you're standing together, or maybe you're standing with a friend, you could do this with each other. I don't want you to feed it to each other, but I want you to pass your wafer to your spouse or to a friend as a symbolic gesture of the brokenness and the surrender that you have to each other. The brokenness and the surrender that you have to your wife. The brokenness and surrender that you have to your husband. Father God, I thank you for your body that was broken for our healing. Let's partake. And then Jesus took the cup, and you'll notice you can take the entire tab now. Peel it back gently, or you'll have grape juice all over the person in front of you, trust me. This is grape juice, by the way. Jesus said, as you take the cup, this represents my blood. And this morning, I believe that as we take the cup, it's it's symbolic to the restoration that the Lord wants to do in every single one of our lives, the restoration of our minds, restoration of our souls, the restoration of our bodies, the restoration of our relationships. So in a sense, as you take the cup, as you take this in, You're taking in the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us, but you're taking in his forgiveness. You're also taking in the faith and the ability that you have in yourself to forgive. Remember when Jesus said, for those who are unable to forgive are those who are unable to be forgiven. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul lays out that there should be a moment of examination within yourself. Before you take communion, there should be a moment, a pause of examination. Because if there's any forgiveness or unforgiveness or bitterness in you, no matter what the circumstance or situation, be careful not to take that against yourself. Because as we take the cup, we're taking in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ through his blood. And so as you think of your spouse and you think of your relationships, again, I want us to trade this as a symbol as a symbol to each other of the forgiveness that we are going to give to each other on a daily basis. Those of you that are in strong relationships, especially marriages, you know that forgiveness has to play a huge part. Father God, I thank you for the juice that represents your blood and for the forgiveness and restoration of our souls through that blood and through that resurrection, Father. We praise you for it this morning. In Jesus' name, let's take of the cup together. 
if you would hold on to the cups till the end of the service and then throw them away in the trash cans as you leave. This morning, as we close with the response song, I, I want to invite you, if you're here this morning, I use the term on the rocks or nearing the rocks or troubled or God is here this morning and wants to restore. God is here this morning and he wants to enrich. So as we sing this final song, I ask you to take a moment during the song and ask yourself, what is the Holy Spirit saying? What would the Holy Spirit have you do with today's message? I pray for myself as I've worked this message out in my own heart that I would not be the same after preaching it as I was before I preached it. What's the Holy Spirit saying? Father God, I just thank you for this church, for our relationships in and out of marriage, Father. I pray for healing. I pray for restoration. I pray for enrichment this morning. That, that in our hearts and our minds, the words that we've heard this morning, they wouldn't just be a momentary thing, but we would take them with us, that your spirit would remind us of our roles. Your spirit would empower us through our roles. Your spirit would enrich us as we grab a hold of our God-given calling to respect and to love unconditionally, not just in our marriages, but in every relationship. In every relationship. May we respect, may we love, may we, we, we enrich, may we encourage, may we motivate, may we hold accountable. Father, bring a richness to our relationships again. No more of this, this just superficial, hey, how are you doing stuff, but put us back into, into God-centered koinonia where we are diving deep into each other's lives loving each other unconditionally, surrendering daily. As we declare this song to you, Father, Holy Spirit, enrich us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.